Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Sandro Stikic, and today I'll be presenting to you my talk, which is titled How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Rust Compiler. So, what is Rust? Well, Rust is a general purpose, compiled, and strongly typed programming language. The tagline is fast, reliable, and productive, pick three. Rust does not, usually, does not use a garbage collector, and Rust apps have no runtime dependencies. So all the dependencies are statically linked with the exception of libc, but you also have the option of using muscle, uh, which will give you a static libc. So yes, you'll have virtually no runtime dependencies. So this raises the question of well, what's wrong with C and C++. To answer that, we need to take a detour into the current state of systems programming. So I used to use C and C++ quite regularly. Uh, they're very common in simulations and game engines. But before I could begin to work at the problem at hand, my mental stack is held hostage by non-trivial amounts of esoteric implementation details. Now, the, comp uh, the consequence of not doing this is your program will be left unsound. So I'm left with a sliver of my mental stack free to actually solve the problem. Now, while it's hard to describe the experience, I'd liken it to being waterboarded by the compiler. That's about as close as I can get. Anyhow, here's some fun C++ errors. This one's pretty scary. How about another? Mm, that one's getting quite hard to read. One more. Now this just turns into noise. By the way, if you think these examples are contrived, go write a program that uses standard variant and have it compile first time. I'll wait. Moving on, so tooling. Uh, as you've seen, C and C++ have some of the most unintelligible error message I've ever had the displeasure of being exposed to. Uh, you'll also be surprised to hear that the situation gets worse. So there is a deafening lack of tooling standardization. Now this contributes to a very, very high barrier of entry. Now from the top of my head, I can name five competing build systems and they're all awful. So you have POSIX make, GNU make, which is different, uh, auto tools, X make, C make, Ninja, there's more, they're all awful. Um, I do not wish this pain on my worst enemies. It's that bad. So once you pick one of the uh, infinite build systems that are available, prepare to spend the next hour at least trawling through 90s tier documentation. Now to be clear, I'm talking unstyled HTML, white on black, 12 point times new Roman. Uh, and on top of that, it's just a parameter dump. There's no examples at all. Uh, so you work through all of that and it still doesn't work because you forgot to install a compiler and you forgot to install libc++. I think we can do better. Uh, here are a few examples of the outputs from the Rust compiler. So as you can see in this case, the user is being informed that um, due to how they've structured their code, one of their branches is always false due to a math implication. I think this one's quite impressive. And here's another interesting one. Uh, by default, if the linter can detect that you're doing a quadratic array sort, it's denied by default um, and it'll let you know that you're doing a quadratic sort and also provide a suggestion to try quick sort or something else. So the tools are bad, but at least the language is reliable, right? Uh, nope, both C and C++ are considered memory unsafe. Now there's a concept of undefined behavior in C and C++. And this refers to aspects of the language where the result of an operation is deliberately left unspecified by the standard. Uh, in other words, the outcome is non-deterministic. There's a common joke that undefined behavior could do anything, including summoning nasal demons. Uh, did you dereference an old pointer? That's undefined behavior. Did you use an uninitialized variable? That is also undefined behavior. So to reiterate, uh, undefined behavior is not only valid as far as the standard is concerned, the compiler won't stop you, uh, and it introduces a non-deterministic behavior into your program. 
uh, have fun debugging why your app is seg faulting when there's a full moon outside. Uh, on top of that, C and C++ require the programmer to manually manage the memory. Now, not only is this error prone to leaking uh, from programmers who have forgotten to free their memory, there is also a whole class of bugs associated with memory safety. Uh, for instance, you have buffer overflows, uh, buffer under reads, race conditions, you have use after freeze, uh, null pointer dereferences, wild pointers, double freeze. You get the idea, the list is quite extensive. Uh, additionally, C and C++ are described as being strongly typed, which I disagree with because it is far too easy to completely sidestep the type system and it is far too difficult to enforce compile time guarantees. Uh, but hey, don't listen to me. I'm just some random schmuck on the internet. Here's some data from Microsoft, uh, which found that memory safety is directly responsible for 70% of their CVEs. Okay, well, you know, maybe you don't like Microsoft. Maybe you think their programmers aren't good enough. Well, have you used curl? It's a pretty uh, popular open source app. It's kind of a Swiss army knife for web protocols. Here's the lead developer of curl stating that 52% of their reported CVEs were directly caused by memory unsafety. As an added bonus, he also graphed out the um, duration that a CVE remained undetected in the code base. Now, if I'm reading this correctly, it's a bit hard to parse. Uh, it's an average of several years, and some of these CVEs were ex uh, have existed for more than a decade before being detected. So I don't think it is a wild statement to say that if your code base depends on C and C++, there are memory safety vulnerabilities that are just waiting to be exploited. Now, there is a pervasive attitude in the C and C++ community that the aforementioned issues are solved by writing better code. Unfortunately, this does not nearly align with reality, and a quick glance at a list of CVEs would tell you otherwise. Uh, I recently watched a talk by a software security engineer. His name is Alex Gaynor, and it was titled Quantifying Memory Unsafety and People's Reactions to It. And among other things, he likens the reaction to um, the stages of grief. And it goes over many of the dubious claims within the C and C++ community, and then debunks them using empirical data. Now, one of his key points was that while discipline doesn't scale, tools do. Now, the C and C++ standards, they're produced by a standard committee. Um, now, this committee has flown out several times a year um, so they can meet and plan the next standard. Now, I have nothing against anyone on the standards committee. I'm sure they're all wonderful people. However, this process is woefully inefficient. Now, when this is combined with the state of denial that the community is in, it's no wonder that the language is evolving at a snail's pace. <clears throat> but enough about crusty, unsafe languages. Let's talk about Rust. So why Rust? Uh, as I mentioned, Rust's tagline is fast, reliable, productive, pick three. And it achieves this forbidden trifecta through the borrow checker, the rich standard tooling, and a very expressive type system. So here are the results from a 2017 study which investigated the energy, time, and memory usage um, in relation to many um, popular programming languages. Now, in this study, uh, Rust matches C's energy consumption and execution time within a very small margin of error, and it also cleanly beats out C++. Now, to be clear, benchmarks are very fickle, and the results are heavily dependent on the methodology used. Nevertheless, there is a trend that can be noticed where Rust performance does closely rival or surpass, in cases, C and C++. Uh, one of the many reasons this is possible is due to the borrow checker, which validates reference lifetimes at compile time, not at runtime. This is in contrast to standard unique pointer, standard share pointer, standard weak pointer in the C++ standard library, where they're validated at runtime 
and they're also not safe. Um, in fact, I saw a, wee, uh, a tweet a couple weeks ago um, where a developer accidentally took a reference to a standard SharePoint, I believe, and his program exploded because the the ref count wasn't <laughs> the ref count wasn't uh, correct with how many references were actually available. Um, furthermore, the borrow checker makes it far easier to write concurrent programs and concurrent algorithms, which means that your program can go faster for not a whole lot more work. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Rust makes use of the borrow checker in order to enforce its ownership model. This means that a Rust program is guaranteed to be memory and thread safe. It takes inspiration from many functional programming languages. Um, and Rust has a very rich type system, which allows you to encode domain constraints into the type, meaning that you can make invalid states unrepresentable. The combination of these systems mean that many classes of bugs are just eliminated at compile time. They simply can't exist. So to demonstrate these memory safety features, here is a brief example. Uh, in our main function, we have two variables. We have S1 and S2. So S1 is initialized to an instance of the string type, which is an own string with the value hello. We then set S2 equal to S1. Now for context, by default in Rust, if a type does not implement the copy trait, which signals that a type can be trivially copied, it is moved. Types such as integers and booleans implement copy since they can be bitwise copied. In this case, string does not implement copy since it contains a pointer to heap allocated memory, um, which means that S1 is moved and not copied into S2. Now we can see in the diagram that the string type is actually very simple. It contains a pointer to the contents of the string, a length and a capacity. Now when S1 is moved into S2, all we're doing is performing a bitwise shallow copy. And then we're marking S1 as being moved from this is very, very efficient because of the contents of the string don't actually need to be copied, only the pointer. So when we try to compile, here's what happens. The compiler helpfully lets us know that we're trying to use a value that's been moved from and why that move occurred. And as we can see, the borrow checker is preventing memory unsafety from occurring. In this case, we try to use a dangling pointer, which is when we, when we use a value that's been moved from. So another example here, except this time on thread safety, we're creating a string and then we're spawning a thread and then printing said string from within the thread. Uh, finally, we're joining the thread to make sure that the thread's execution finishes before we exit main. So can anyone spot the issue here? The issue is that the thread is trying to reference a value that it doesn't own and the borrow checker can't guarantee that the reference is valid for the lifetime of the thread. This is a very, very common problem in concurrent programming. So let's try compiling it. And we can see the compiler has helpfully informed us that we're doing something dangerous. It's explained what the problem is and actually provided us a way to fix it. So to fix this code, we need to tell the thread to take ownership of all the values that it references. And we can do this through the move keyword, which is put before closure. Now, if you like what you're seeing, I have very good news. It gets better. <laughs> so not only is Rust safe and reliable, it is also very productive. Uh, you've seen firsthand how helpful the compiler is, but what about the rest of the tooling package? Well, Rust ships with a complete tool chain by default, which includes Cargo, the package manager, Rust C, the Rust compiler, Rust format, which is a code formatter, Rust doc, which is the documentation generator, Clippy, which is a linter that parses the AST generated by the compiler to produce a very, very meaningful lint. They were responsible for those slides at the start of the talk. Uh, and Rust Analyzer, which is the compiler front end for IDE integration, such as for VS Code. Now, as I mentioned, um, Rust's package manager is called Cargo and the packages are called Crates. So when a crate is uploaded to crates.io, which is the official Crates registry, uh, crates registry it automatically uses Rust doc to generate documentation. And then those docs are then automatically published to docs.rs, which is the official documentation website. In all, both the standard and almost all third-party crates use the same documentation system. 
Now, I believe this is one of the main reasons why the documentation and story in Rust is known to be far ahead of other languages. But enough talk, let's make an app together and we'll see just how easy Rust is to use. So the first thing that we have to do is install Cargo. Now, if you're on a Unix system, you run this one liner and you're more or less done. On Windows, they also provide an exe that you can run. Next, now that we have Cargo installed, we can simply run Cargo new and provide a project name. And what Cargo will do is make a new directory, initialize a Git repository within that directory, create a create manifest, which is that cargo.toml file, and it'll make a hello world, which is contained within that main.rs files. And they look like this. The cargo.toml is the create manifest. It's very simple. It just contains the package name, the version, and the Rust edition that it's compiling for. Um, and then yeah, the hello world is hello world. To run the app, we simply run cargo run, as you can imagine. And that'll take care of pulling down all the dependencies, building all of them, and linking, and running. We also have first class testing support. So I've written a function called left pad, which prepends um, a padding string repeated uh, X amount of times to another string. By the way, any resemblance to <laughs> other libraries living or dead is purely coincidental. So now that we have our function, here's how we can test it. So we declare a module called test and we put a configuration attribute above it saying to only build it um, when tests are to be run. So that's what that CFG test is doing. And then inside that module, we have our function, our unit test called left pad test. And we let the compiler know that this is a unit test with that test attribute just above the function. Now I've deliberately made the test fail so that we can see what happens. And if we run cargo test, as we can see, it fails and it'll let you know why it failed, you know, which line and what were the expected inputs and outputs. So that's more or less it. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, try Rust today. It is by far the most exciting thing that I've looked into in the last, I don't know, five years. And it really provides a ray of hope that systems programming or just general purpose programming does not need to be awful, as is the case with C and C++, we can do better. So give it a try. Um, it's very easy to get into. There is a learning curve when you start, especially with the with the borrow checker. You'll be wrestling it for a bit, but once you pass that hump, you'll uh, you'll feel like a god, uh, you know, god on earth. It's it's really uh, it's liberating. I can actually focus on the thing that I want to solve rather than having to faff around with uh, all of the implications of C and C plus uh, plus. Anyway, there's also an excellent book that you can get. It's called The Book. It's for free. Um, you can order a physical copy if you'd like. Um, but yeah, it's very, very detailed and it goes through step by step what you need to know uh, with examples. So give it a try. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk.